My name is Dr. Wayne Schroeder, an adjunct professor at IWP, and I'll be moderating today's event. For those of you who are new to the Institute of World Politics, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, a doctoral program, and two new online Master of Arts programs. If you're interested in learning more about IWP, please visit us at our website, www.iwp.edu. Our speaker for today's lecture is Michael Ryan. Mr. Ryan served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for European and NATO policy in the Pentagon, following a distinguished career in the United States Air Force and the Senior Executive Service. Graduate of the Air Force Academy, Colonel Ryan began his career as a fighter pilot, flying the A-10 in the European Theater of Operations. His extensive background in world affairs includes service at NATO headquarters, the US mission to the European Union, the US European Command Headquarters, and in the, of course, the Office of the Secretary of Defense. He is a graduate of the French War College in Paris, was a National Defense Fellow uh, at, in the US Congress, and is a distinguished graduate of the Joint Military Intelligence College. He holds a master's degree in international relations and has lectured extensively in Europe and the United States. His latest articles on transatlantic relations appeared recently in the national interest. He's here today to discuss the topic, Europe is essential and NATO is the key. Mr. Secretary, welcome to IWP and please proceed. Thank you, Dr. Schroeder. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I really appreciate the gift of your time to talk about my favorite topic, which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, which I believe is the key to our successful collective future with Europe and as a free world. So let me tell you why I think that's so. I always like to get started with some ground truths that we often overlook in our debates. And so I just wanted to make sure we keep those in mind as we discuss NATO this afternoon. The first is that the value of NATO is that it exists. We often forget the importance of having 30 nations that can convene on very short notice at the highest levels of government to make rapid decisions in a crisis. And that is supported by not only an international staff of civilians, but an international military staff, a military committee that provides best military advice, and a NATO command structure, which is the unique function of NATO as an international organization, separate from all other international organizations. NATO has the ability to rapidly accept force contributions from nations and employ them effectively through a very well-practiced and well-staffed NATO command structure. So NATO has value just because it exists. It has a convening authority to bring these nations, not just the 30 NATO nations together, but the 40 partner nations of NATO, the major non-NATO allies around the world, to the table to discuss the most urgent crises that we face. And the example of NATO's role in the defeat ISIS coalition is an example of NATO's ability to do that. And so we shouldn't lose sight of that. Another thing we tend to lose sight of in the debates in the United States is that we are always going to pay in the red for NATO. The United States is never going to make a profit in numbers, in budgets at NATO. The profit we gain is having an alliance, having the credibility that comes with 29 other nations agreeing with us through consensus, demonstrating solidarity and cohesion as an organization that's responsible for the lives of a, a billion people and one third of the global GDP. So it really is an immense opportunity that the United States has to be able to operate on the world stage alongside our NATO allies in the context of NATO. And again, we're always gonna pay in the red for that. We're never gonna make a budgetary profit, uh, but it's worth it. NATO plus NATO's 30 nations plus 40 partners, if you think about it, is more than a third of the nations that are members of the United Nations. So when we think about global security, NATO really is providing the opportunity to build global security from the ground up to really meet the vision of the United Nations when it was founded to be able to do so. The other issue that we lose sight of in the United States is burden sharing. 
burden sharing has been a problem for every American president from President Eisenhower through President Biden. Every one of them has complained that the Europeans are not doing enough and the Europeans consistently don't do enough in the context of spending their defense budgets on NATO requirements. So the famous 2% pledge, uh, about a third of the nations, a little more than a third now, meet the 2% pledge. But when we think about the burden of being in NATO, the war was always going to be in Europe. A significant number of US forces have been stationed in Europe and the burden on the Europeans of this challenge of providing the infrastructure, providing the transport networks, the communication networks, the hospitals, and all these other things that don't get counted in the defense budget is something that we have to keep in mind. Yes, the Europeans should spend the 2% that they pledged, but that's not the whole story when it comes to burden. And so when we have a debate with our European colleagues about this, we have to keep in mind the difference between burden and defense spending. So having served in the previous administration, I get asked a lot about uh, the sea change in US policy towards NATO when President Trump came into office. <laughs> I like to say that's a fabrication of people's imaginations because one thing that's certain about US policy towards NATO and it's being reinforced by the Congress time and again is continuity of the US position in NATO. That the, iron, the Article 5 commitment the United States has made to our NATO allies is ironclad. We continue to station almost 90,000 US forces in Europe to support that ironclad commitment to Article 5. And while the style of that engagement and the emphasis on defense budgets and other burdens may change over time, the ironclad commitment remains. So there's a great deal of continuity in US policy towards NATO. And I myself was involved in a lot of conversations trying to separate style from substance on that very topic with our European allies. Uh, to great effect, I have to admit. The biggest worry the Europeans have is not from one administration to the next, because from George Bush at the beginning where they disagreed with him to the end where they agreed with him, President Obama, where they agreed with him at the beginning and they disagreed with him at the end, it ebbs and flows. The big concern for the Europeans is whether or not the United States is returning to an isolationist policy when it comes to the role of the United States on the world stage. And therefore, this contributes to the last point I want to make on this topic, and that is the Europeans are suffering an identity crisis as to whether or not they're full trusted partners of the United States, whether or not they need to go it alone under the guise of the European Union, or whether they need to find a separate space between the United States and China in great power competition. I'm happy to say that most of the Europeans with whom I deal and with whom I discuss realize that their futures are completely tied to those of the United States because we share common values and a common heritage and a common commitment uh, to peace, freedom, and the rights of human beings everywhere. The economic realities, on the other hand, some of the opportunities that are presented by the Chinese and others for Europe strain at Europe's desire to be able to stand on its own two feet to demonstrate what they call European strategic autonomy and to be able to have sovereignty of their own decision making as a full partner of the United States within the context of NATO. So that's a process that's ongoing. It's something we need to be aware about. And it's something that's very germane to the main point of my talk this afternoon. And that is why Europe is essential to the future of the United States and why NATO is the way to cement that future together. There are three issues that we really have to address in the global context today. Because the question we have to ask ourselves is how do we collectively, that would be the 30 allies in NATO and NATO's 40 partners, how do we, collect, how do we rise to our collective imperatives? In other words, how do we put the collective interest ahead of our national interests in things like climate change, food and water security, mass migration, the rise of global terrorism, which are, is the result of, along with migration, failing states, failed states, poor governance, and other issues which are making it difficult for weak governments to extend their control over their entire territory. And then, We've all experienced the pandemic recently. And so health security is another challenge of our collective set of imperatives with which we must deal. So what's the best way to do that? And you'll notice I did not say great power competition because that is another collective imperative. And that's the main focus of what I wanna talk about for the next couple of minutes. In great power competition, there's a simple formula that we have to keep in mind because collectively, 
all allies have a single set of resources and we have a single set of challenges. So the question is, how do we effectively apply our collective resources to our collective challenges so that our resources always exceed those challenges? In other words, how do we stay ahead of the game? How do we make early decisions? How do we allocate resources, manage risk where resources are insufficient, and then, and then move on together to start to solve problems? This is particularly important in a time of great power competition where we, the West, NATO allies, plus Japan, Australia, India, and others, are the ones who take on the responsibility of dealing with these collective imperatives, such as droughts, mass migration, terrorism, other things, which really become levers and opportunities for our competitors, namely Russia and China, uh, to use either to get us to contribute more resources to those causes or to leverage those causes uh, to cause political disarray amongst us. So to get at these problems, I think there's three points that we have to keep in mind with respect to the transatlantic relationship. One is we, the first is we require transatlantic resilience. The second, we require transatlantic unity. And the third, we, based on that unity, we must demonstrate transatlantic strategic autonomy. So let's get right to the first one, resilience. Resilience is the opportunity or the ability to continue to operate under stress, under adverse conditions, or even under attack if need be, to bounce back and to get back to work to get things done. In the transatlantic space, because of these global imperatives, but also because of the hybrid gray zone activities of our potential adversaries, Russia and China, we're losing the ability in many ways to operate within our own space, whether it's Chinese foreign direct investment into key industries, Chinese ownership of critical infrastructure like the Greek port of Piraeus near Athens, whether it's Russian disinformation campaigns that are turning our younger population particularly against the idea of NATO and collective defense, whether it's disinformation campaigns and political extortion that prohibit NATO's ability to achieve consensus on any particular given issue, and all the other things that happen in the gray zone that undermine our ability to operate together, whether it's cyber attacks on our critical infrastructure, on our transport networks, Huawei and the networks of Europe, and the previous administration was very good in getting allies to eliminate Huawei from NATO's networks so that we could continue to operate securely in that environment. So all of these issues add up to the need for transatlantic resilience. NATO's made resilience a national requirement, which it is, but there's also a requirement to work across national boundaries to ensure the overall resilience of the alliance, which is the transatlantic community. And so transatlantic resilience is very important for our ability to continue to operate effectively and to remain masters of our own fate. This commitment to transatlantic resilience requires really transatlantic unity. And when we look at the power of the transatlantic economy as one third in value of global GDP, but also one half of purchasing power parity value of global GDP. So almost 50% of glo global GDP in the transatlantic economy. If we are unified, if we use our element of economic power effectively as a transatlantic community, then we're able to withstand the economic challenge of China or other competitors so that we maintain masters, we maintain the ability to remain masters of our own fate. President von der Leyen of the European Commission said as much at the virtual Munich Security Conference last February that those who allow others to set the standards then dictate how we will live within our societies. And we don't want anybody to do that for us. And so transatlantic unity is really a key to our strength. Transatlantic resilience is the key to our ability to continue to use that strength effectively around the globe, which comes to my third point, the need to continue to demonstrate transatlantic strategic autonomy. Transatlantic strategic autonomy is our collective ability to operate in the global commons, for example. So the freedom of navigation operations that the United States, Britain, France, and now Germany are conducting in the South China Sea are absolutely an essential demonstration of our ability to insist on our rights under international law and to continue to demonstrate our willingness to, to exercise those rights. Space is another one of the global commons. The Russians just detonated an ASAT test recently uh, without notice to the rest of the world. That is a very valuable strategic commons in which we need to demonstrate our autonomy and we need to collectively take them to task 
for that irresponsible act. Cyberspace is another global commons where we need to be masters of the domain. So by putting these three things together, transatlantic resilience, transatlantic unity, and transatlantic demonstrations of strategic autonomy, we will be then able to exercise our will, our rights, and our desires on a global stage, because our desire is not to treat China or Russia as an adversary, but to have them play by the international set of rules of the rules-based world order on a level playing field where we're happy to compete with them on any given day. So the best way to summarize all of this really is to put it in a very simple equation. And that is the sum of the resources of North America plus those of Europe plus our other allies and partners around the world, Australia, Japan, South Korea, India, others. The sum total of those resources has to be greater than the costs imposed upon us by Russia, China, and their erstwhile allies, such as Iran and North Korea. And in this way, we will always have sufficient resource as a transatlantic community to pay those costs that are imposed upon us by the activities of the Russians and the Chinese. Now, given recent events, this still does not imply that the Russians and the Chinese are working together against us, but each of them in their, individually in their own way impose costs on us, along with Iran and others, such that we as a transatlantic community need to find a way to effectively marshal our resources and apply those resources to maintain and to extend our freedom and our influence around the world. So when we sum all this up, <clears throat> we see that in this infinite game, as Simon Sinek would call it, if you haven't seen his book, The Infinite Game, he lays out that it's not about winning or losing, it's about staying in the game. And our collective will is, as I said, not to compete on an unplaying level field with adversaries, but to compete openly on a level playing field according to the rules of the road set down in the rules-based world order, so that together we can fulfill the promise of humanity. NATO, in my view, is the organizing principle for that to happen, because the greatest challenge to our prosperity and our way of life will come as our security begins to fail. And therefore, NATO's role is to identify what is required to sustain our security, to see where those vulnerabilities exist, and then what, to work with partners such as the European Union, the OSCE, and others to make sure that those vulnerabilities do not weaken our ability to, to maintain our security. And therefore, NATO, as it looks out at its task, which is to defend and deter all adversaries as a transatlantic alliance, it needs to maintain the capability and the will to do that. Any challenges to that capability and will to do that have to be addressed and they have to be addressed early. And therefore NATO's role in this global perspective is to ensure our security by identifying potential vulnerabilities, whether it's Chinese ownership of critical infrastructure or Russian hybrid activity or Iranian malign influence. And where NATO doesn't have the capability to deal with those potential vulnerabilities, it needs to work with partners and here very closely with the European Union that has a lot of the competencies in this area to make sure that at all times the transatlantic community remains secure and maintains the capability uh, to deter adversaries so that we can maintain peace in our time. So that's why I think NATO is the central convening organization. It is the only table in Europe where the United States has a seat and all allies agree, and leaders have said this as recently as the leaders meeting in London, but also the recent summit in Brussels, that NATO is the indispensable forum for transatlantic security consultations and decisions. We need to use it as such. We need to understand how it works, and we need to understand how to apply the resources within the entire community to deal with the challenges that we all face. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Schroeder, and hopefully uh, we'll have some questions and we can get into a very detailed discussion uh, on any topic that you'd like to talk about. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for that, that tour de horizon, if you will, of uh, NATO, its essentiality, uh, it, the challenges facing NATO, and the, the need for United States leadership uh, in this regard. Uh, we have several questions. I think I'll kick it off first at, with, with one, uh, and then we'll go to the, we already have, I think, two up uh, in the queue. 
uh, Mr. Secretary, NATO is in the process of developing its new strategic concept for the 2022 Madrid summit. In light of your opening remarks, uh, which priorities do you think NATO should be emphasizing in its new strategic concept? Well, that's a great question. I've been involved in lots of discussions uh, over the years, but most recently in the last few weeks on the next NATO strategic concept. And there's a lot to do, that much is certain. Anything from dealing with the new Russian threats to how to deal with the assertiveness of China, to how to deal with collective resilience, to how to deal with emerging and disruptive technologies. I think the greatest challenge for the environment is its ability to make decisions at speed. Because NATO has been adapting since the end of the Cold War and have been adapting quite effectively. But it, all the challenges to which NATO has been adapting, if you will, were on a slow burner. Whether it was in instability in the Balkans or the threat of terrorism from Afghanistan, which we entered into quite rapidly, but it still was a slow buildup uh, after we got into that particular operation. And to dealing with cyber and dealing with other challenges that were just below the radar, they're just below the level where people started to take them seriously as a threat, and therefore NATO had time to adapt. In the projected future, regardless of who you listen to or who you talk to, the pace of challenge is increasing. But NATO is a multinational bureaucracy, and bureaucracy is resistant to change. It's not really prone to thinking about the future, it really is in many ways stuck in its ways. So the Secretary General launched at the leaders meeting actually in 2019, a reflection group on strengthening the political dimension of the Alliance. And that reflection group came up with several incredibly interesting ideas, but in my view, they didn't go far enough in really laying out how the, the Alliance, again, is the organizing principle for 70 nations within the security domain, is going to allocate its resources to make decisions within, in time to deal with the pressing challenges that are affecting all of the nations. So easy to say, how do you do that? Uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about is really to get the leaders, which means the Secretary General, the Assistant Secretaries General, the ambassadors and the military representatives to really start developing their decision literacy. That is to understand the complexity of the 21st century, the complexity of the non-traditional challenges to security, which are now very much evident in our security debates, and how we bring in other resources and other partners to begin to deal with those. Resilience has been the first test of that, and I think NATO's rising to the challenge of understanding how to build a re resilient community. Uh, the Scandinavians are very good at that, and they've been very helpful in forward-leaning within NATO on the decisions that need to be made under the rubric of resilience. Many people talk about the need to add resilience as a fourth core competency or core task for NATO. I think there's a lot to be thought about there and a lot to be said about that. Because without a resilient environment, NATO is not capable of carrying out its defense and deterrence mission. And if we think about this in real terms, in the context of great power competition, NATO's adversaries have for years been pursuing an indirect strategy to undermine NATO's ability to muster its impressive collective military capability in a head-on defense, if you will, of a, of a military attack on the alliance. So adversaries are really attempting to win without fighting, and they're attempting to do that by undermining uh, the cohesion, the solidarity of the alliance, of the alliance's ability to move forces rapidly over across European transport networks, to communicate effectively, and to make decisions by consensus. And uh, disinformation has been a key aspect of that campaign. We need to make sure that our leadership understands this, the implications of this for NATO's ability to continue to provide credible deterrence, but also to be able to have that discussion in the context of these global imperatives that I discussed. So we need to raise our gaze, if you will. It's always been a challenge to think about and to talk about global NATO with allies, because many allies see that as the United States trying to use US or European resources to pursue US interests in the world. 
the challenges in the world now argue for the US and Europe to address these global challenges together as partners. And so we really need to do that. And that's the political dimension that needs to be reestablished at the Alliance. The Secretary General has been calling for NATO allies to bring all security issues to the table at NATO. And I think that is the number one thing. We figure out how to get allies to do that and then to how to have fruitful conversations where the collective interest is more important than the national interests, because without our collective pursuit of our collective interests, we might not have any national wherewithal left to address those national interests. So I'll leave it at that. Hopefully that was an adequate answer. It was very good. Okay, we have now about six quest five or six questions in the queue. So I'm gonna set my others aside and we're gonna let uh, the audience uh, get to their to their questions. I'll start first with a question from a gentleman named uh, uh, Christian Orr. Uh, Christian is a former U.S. officer and current U.S. Air Force Europe contractor. His question is this, what sort of working relationship do you foresee between NATO and OSCE? You did mention OSCE in your remarks, particularly the latter special monitoring mission, SMM, in Ukraine over the next one to three years? Great. You know, Dr. Schroeder, I'd be happy to take uh, three or four questions because they generally relate to one another. Okay. Or we can do them one at a time. Well, I'll give you a couple others. That was, okay. that, was that question that with respect to uh, uh, NATO and OSCE and the SSM for Ukraine. Then there was another a question. Isn't the main goal of NATO to support joint integration between member states? And then, the, then a third question, I'll leave it at three. Uh, 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 what about tensions between Britain and the EU? How would those affect defense? Three great questions, and they go great together. And let me tell you why. In the interlocking set of security institutions, so here we say the UN, NATO, the OSCE, the EU, Council of Europe, pick the number of organizations you want. Uh, the commonality is the members of those organizations. And we have always relied on the members of those organizations to do internal coordination in their governments and then to br bring coherent positions back to the table of each organization. So that's the theory of the case. If that were true, then all the members of NATO who are also members of the, the OSCE would be pursuing the same position and a coherent position within the OSCE that would allow us really to, to benefit as an alliance from the activities of the monitoring mission to get an understanding of what the monitoring mission is seeing and reporting, and then to, to use that as a basis for further NATO debate and action. It's hit or miss actually on how well that works. There's a lot of reasons for that. One is our own incoherent bureaucracies in many capitals, including Washington, and our inability to, to talk across corridors from time to time. Another issue with the OSCE is the fact of there are other members of the OSCE that won't permit the OSCE to share that information with outside organizations. Again, this is why we have to rely back on the nations, because again, NATO doesn't make any decisions, all decisions are made in capitals. So one would assume that a capitals perspective on Ukraine is informed by their participation in the OSC, maybe their physical participation in the monitoring mission. In practice, what I've seen is there is enough overlap and enough discussion uh, between the ministries of foreign affairs, the ministries of defense, so our State Department, Department of Defense, and allies about what's actually going on the ground, that there are no surprises. And in fact, a lot of things are not set at the table for good diplomatic reasons in order to keep multiple initiatives moving forward. But having said all that, I do think that the OSC is an underutilized body. And since the demise of the conventional forces in Europe treaty has been less connected to NATO, uh, NATO allies have been pushing the United States, for example, to do more in arms control. But given the difficult decision-making process in the OSCE uh, based on the activities of the Russian Federation that hasn't been as fruitful as we would have liked. 
And this gets to the point on joint integration. Interoperability is what NATO calls the ability of allied forces to work together. Whether those forces can be joined or not is really a national responsibility, although NATO has increasingly conducted joint exercises. But the joint integration of allies, as I was talking about, given their perspectives within the OSCE, for example, or within the EU, for example, and how allies can build coherent positions within each organization so that each organization can fulfill its respective mandate in the overall context of a set of interlocking security institutions is incredibly important. And it's an area of that political improvement in the NATO Alliance under the next strategic concept that I think is worth a lot of examination is how do nations in NATO, we call them member states in the European Union and members of the OSCE without forming a caucus in each organization, but how do they collaborate bilaterally and multilaterally, multilaterally outside those organizations to ensure mutually supportive and reinforcing positions in each organization so that the overall collective result enhances our security and doesn't diminish it. And it doesn't provide our potential adversaries the opportunity to use these organizations against us to divide and conquer and to split off various allies uh, from consensus decisions in each organization. So I think jointness in the military sense is happening through interoperability, joint efforts within nations, and then joint exercises in NATO. And US European Command has a lot to do to bring that together. I think at the political level, and again, where the next NATO strategic concept needs to focus a lot of new effort, because the old strategic concept is still very valid in many ways, is to be able to bring more coherence to the set of interlocking security institutions that we have, and it's up to the member states to work together to do that. Uh, which brings us to the UK and the EU. So the UK, when it comes to European defense in particular, which is di directly relevant to NATO, was in many ways the holdout in allowing for consensus to move European defense forward under an EU banner. Because they, in their view, that was better done and more properly done at NATO, where we represented more of the European nations than just in the European Union, and more collective power in NATO than is available in the European Union. And there are 580 million citizens in NATO who are not in the European Union. So the European Union is not synonymous with uh, Europe or with even half of NATO. So the UK coming out of the EU has in the context of transatlantic defense and security added emphasis to NATO because the UK forces are now not available for EU military operations, although they could contribute if they wanted to. Uh, but the UK is very much focusing all of its effort on enhancing the capabilities of the alliance in general. Having said that, the UK is very engaged diplomatically and militarily with all allies on the continent, whether they be EU member states or NATO nations. And they bring a cohes cohesion to that equation uh, that even more than the United States can bring allows for more and better consensus within the alliance. Because of the UK's strong military position in Europe, there really is no European military capability to speak of in an expeditionary sense without the UK. And so the UK is still very much a factor when we talk about uh, a European pillar of the alliance very much has to involve the UK. The UK's debates with the EU really don't center on defense. European defense is politically more viable now that the UK is not blocking it in the European Union. However, the UK not being in the European Union really hasn't done anything to undermine the defense pillar of Europe within the context of the NATO alliance. If anything, it enhances it because the UK is no longer fettered with having to deal with EU issues on the side. So the role of nations in all of this, whether it be the UK out of the EU, uh, Ukraine and other nations in the OSCE, or the ability to, to integrate common positions within the alliance or within any other international organization, really comes back to what I said about decisions are made in capitals. And that's going to be true for all of these organizations going forward.
Okay, we have several more questions. Uh, Mr. Secretary, let me uh, 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 pose a couple of them to you. Uh, uh, if NATO, this is more of a, a critical question, if NATO could not successfully execute Odyssey Dawn in Libya against a small insurgency without calling for US help in logistics and intelligence, how can NATO be effective against a real power like Russia? Uh, and then there is another question uh, from a gentleman from uh, Senegal in West Africa. Based on what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, what, uh, what, what could be uh, concretely the actions uh, that the U.S. and NATO could take to uh, force Russia to back down uh, in its plan, both either short term or long term? Oh, two great questions. Uh, with respect to Odyssey Dawn, I always have to remember, remind a lot of my American colleagues uh, from other departments and agencies that the United States is a member of NATO. Let's just let that sink in. So when we talk about US capabilities contributing to NATO operations, it's as a member of the NATO alliance. Why is this important? There are certain capabilities within the alliance that only the United States possesses. Uh, we possess them for very good reasons. And that is because since the end of World War II, we decided to take on global responsibilities and pursue our global interests for peace and security in the world with the military capabilities that we developed during World War II and then since. And those capabilities developed for very good reasons. One is we're 5,000 kilometers from everywhere. So we have to have strategic airlift and strategic strike capabilities because we're so far away from anywhere we wanna be. It means we need to have a global intelligence apparatus that gives us the capability to understand events before they happen so that we can take effective action uh, to sustain security on behalf of ourselves and our allies. This is our contribution to collective security uh, within the transatlantic community. The Europeans contribute in uniquely European ways. And again, as I said at the outset, a lot of their burden is carried by the fact that any war in defense of the alliance is most likely gonna be on European territory. And therefore, all of European societies will be engaged in supporting that effort. That's quite a burden. So Odyssey Dawn came about because of instability on the ground in Libya. And as we learned through NATO's debates over instability in the Western Balkans and instability in Afghanistan, that we can't wait for the instability to come to Europe or to the United States, because that would become an even more difficult problem. And where there was an opportunity to prevent humanitarian catastrophe, NATO was decisively engaged. So the contribution of US capabilities in that instance were wholly appropriate. If we can fault a lot of people, the NATO, the United United Nations, European Union for not following up on that intervention and therefore not dealing effectively with the post-intervention crises. And that's a completely different topic. But it is one that we have to think about in the context of instability in Ukraine. And NATO's done a lot of thinking about what it refers to as the comprehensive approach about how to support other agencies and actors and non-governmental organizations in the international community as NATO provides security so that these other organizations can get to work on dealing with the important and thorny issues on the ground in various places like Libya or Afghanistan or Syria or elsewhere. In Ukraine, we have a functioning sovereign nation that is not a member of the alliance. And all international organizations have mandates and charters that say what they can and cannot do, what they should and should not do, and find their purpose. NATO's purpose is defense of the transatlantic community as defined in the Washington Treaty, and that means members of NATO. The difficult situation here with Ukraine and Georgia as well, it has to be said, is that both have been told that at some day when they meet the conditions, they will be members of NATO. That day is not yet here, and the Russian Federation under President Putin has been working assiduously uh, to prevent their entrance into NATO because they see that as a significant security challenge to their interests and that based on their perspective on global events and they're completely within their rights to feel that way, although I don't agree with them. 
So NATO as a defensive alliance has significant political influence. It has a commitment in Article 2 of the treaty to align our economies for purpose so that we can support the goals and aspirations of the alliance members. And so economically, politically, militarily, and diplomatically, the alliance has a great deal of throw weight, if you will, a great deal of influence on the situation in Ukraine. It's important to look at this question, though, from the Russian perspective. What would influence, convince, compel uh, Russia to not go forward with aggressive military action beyond what they've already done in Ukraine? That is the important question. I think President Biden has been very clear and Secretary Blinken has been very clear uh, in public as to what they've told the Russians, President Putin and Mr. Lavrov, respectively, that there would be significant economic costs imposed upon Russia for any military incursion in Ukraine, and that those costs would be based on the types of economic things that we might do to the Russian Federation that we've never done before, and that we've, we resisted doing before in hopes that diplomacy could see a way forward. As hopes for diplomacy start to dim, these realistic options, economic options principally, come to the fore. And when you look at the vulnerabilities in the Russian economy, if the Europeans were to join us in those economic activities, whether they be sanctions, cutoffs from financial networks, or uh, diversion or diversification of European energy supplies, then that would have an immediate impact on the economy of Russia, and who knows what impact that would have on the stability of the Putin government. Only the Russians would know that. Militarily, it's not within the charter of the alliance to take offensive action against uh, an adversary that is not attacking a member of the alliance and the territory of the member of alliance. That doesn't mean that the alliance couldn't vote to do that. I don't see a, a consensus position that the alliance would vote to do that in this case, uh, but that always has to be on the table as it was in the Balkans when the Serbians were about to go into Kosovo. So I'll leave it at that, Dr. Schroeder. Hopefully that was sufficient. It was, no, excellent. We've got a couple more and then maybe we can wrap up with one final one that I might like to ask. Uh, let's see, we've got a uh, question here. Uh, can you speak a bit about what you think the future might be for the so-called uh, responsibility to protect doctrine. This gets into some of your discussions about uh, kind of out of area issues. Yeah, that's one of my favorite topics to discuss, responsibility to protect. Because it's a values-based discussion. The values are at the core of the transatlantic community. And again, as I mentioned, NATO intervened in Kosovo for that very reason, responsibility to protect, uh, because the Serbian government was not willing to protect the Kosovo citizens who preferred not to be members of Serbia anymore. As we look out at these collective imperatives that all of us need to face, well, let's just take the origins of south to north migration that affects Europe in such a negative way. Many of these people are fleeing not just political persecution, but economic oppression, uh, lack of opportunity. They're, they're fleeing as a result of failed and failing states, the lack of good governance, and the rise of illicit traffickers, smugglers, terrorists, and just living conditions that are beyond the pale. And so they move. In many places, these conditions came about from the inability or unwillingness of governments to look after the needs of their own citizens. And as this phenomenon, for whatever reason, expands, and if you look at uh, the central swath of Africa, there's a great deal of instability there based on the government's inability to, to provide for their own citizens. Then the question becomes, as the knock-on effects start to intrude upon European and American sensibilities to the point where we feel it's time to do something about it. The solutions are too difficult, the problems are too complex, and the costs are enormous. 
So if we logically think through when is the best time to get in and help nations take care of their own citizens, uh, the best time is now, which is why the European Union and the United States are the two largest official donors of overseas assistance aid in the world, as we try to get after those issues early on. So that's an important context to get right at the question when a government is actively suppressing or aggressively attacking its citizens. Let's just go back to the situation in Rwanda and Burundi. Then what is the world's responsibility? I think, and I thank you for raising the question, that the world has a responsibility. The question then comes back to one of my original points about our collective resources versus our set of collective challenges. And the challenge for NATO in the next strategic concept going forward to strengthen the political dimension is the ability to have this debate, the ability to understand what are the, what is the single set of challenges we all face? How are we spending our resources to meet those challenges? So then when a new situation arises, such as a government suppressing its population through violence, do we have the wherewithal, the capability, and can we generate the political will to actually do something as an international organization, or better yet, as a set of international organizations, which gets back to nations using an integrated approach in the various organizations of which they're members, to include the members of the UN Security Council, to compel the world to action. We haven't reached that level of maturity in our debates at the highest levels of these organizations, because it always seems there are other priorities that prevent us from getting consensus to do it. And therefore it falls to coalitions of the willing. And those coalitions of the willing are hesitant based on our shortcomings in past interventions. Uh, Odyssey Dawn was brought up in Libya. We mentioned that uh, the situation now in Afghanistan doesn't argue for uh, coalitions of the willing intervening in sovereign nations going forward, but it really is an issue that we have to come to grips with. And it's one that very much has to be on the agenda going forward in organizations like NATO. So I thank you for the question. There is no sufficient answer to that question, but I hopefully I've given you something to think about. Okay, let me see. I think we uh, have pretty much exhausted the questions from the audience. Audience, if you have additional questions, please get them in. I've got a, a couple for. Uh, Secretary Ryan. Um, Mr. Secretary, um, I mean, Moscow is back in the Middle East. Uh, and of course, as you know, uh, we're involved, uh, involved uh, in militarily to help Assad essentially win the Syrian civil war. They've got extended long range 49 year leasing agreements uh, for air and naval facilities in Syria. Given this development and how the Syrian civil war has turned out and, and, and where Moscow is now, how big of a problem will that be for NATO's southern flank, for the Black Sea region, for the Mediterranean? What do we need to do differently now uh, on the, if we're looking uh, more toward the south? Thank you. It's one of the things I worked on while I was in the Pentagon recently, two areas that really have been blind spots for us uh, for bureaucratic reasons more than anything else have been the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, uh, because those tend to be the seams between our organizations, whether it's between UCOM, AFRICOM, and CENTCOM, or between the Department of Defense and the State Department, or between the way governments look at the regions, NATO being principally focused on Europe, the OSCE being an East-West focus, and then the European being European Union, being internally focused, but principally focused on the neighborhood in the East. So we've lost real sight of this. So we have to build the muscle memory of how to understand these regions and then build the relationships and networks necessary uh, to effectively bring capabilities to bear on the problems there. So I'm glad you raised the challenge. It's one that we all have to continue to get after, but specifically, what do we need to do? First and foremost, it gets back to demonstrating strategic autonomy. And we have continued to assert our privileges and rights to operate in the Black Sea. Uh, we reinforced Romania and Bulgaria and their ability not only to defend themselves, and they've invested heavily in that themselves, but their ability to integrate particularly air and missile defense 
and naval maritime operations with those of other NATO nations uh, to strengthen their position. The relationship between Turkey and Russia is particularly challenging with regards to the Black Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean and the situation in Syria. Uh, but the Turks, for all their challenges, have learned, I think, how to deal with Russia in an effective way to hold them somewhat at bay, which they've done in Northwest Syria, and they've done in Armenia, Azerbaijan in that recent conflict, and they've done by selling armed drones to the Ukrainians. So I think the Turks are starting to reassert uh, their desire to have significant Turkish influence in the Black Sea as they've always seen it as their lake, not a Russian lake, which causes some consternation in Moscow, I'm sure. Uh, so there is activity there and we need to continue to, to, as I said, assert our right to that global common. Uh, same in the Eastern Med. I think the issue in the Eastern Med from the Russian standpoint is one of an opportunistic approach to not only further longstanding Russian interests, but really to create a sense of insecurity in the, in the neighborhood and to create a sense of insecurity for NATO, because that's yet another cost that we have to pay. It's yet another issue that we have to deal with. And it really is a bit of, little bit of watch the birdie. Let's get NATO to take their eye off the ball. Let's build, fuel the divisiveness uh, in NATO debates between the South and the North, uh, between the East and the West, because NATO has those four different, if you will, uh, caucuses. Uh, that all operate as one, but there is some tension between the southern nations who have significant issues arising from the southern flank, not the least of which is Russian activity and Eastern Europe. And the last point I'd like to raise, which I think is incredibly important when we look at Russia in the Eastern Mediterranean in particular, let me just say as an aside, I think militarily we're dealing very well with that circumstance, but politically and diplomatically, it presents some challenges that have economic um, potential economic negative outcomes. And one is, and the principal one is, they identified potential of hydrocarbons under the Eastern Mediterranean to meet the needs of Europe's energy future that would then completely disadvantage, you know, Russia incorporated from the standpoint of European dependence on Russian oil and gas. And so as the Europeans work out the rights and responsibilities for exploiting those hydrocarbons in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean and how they're going to develop those and then move those into Europe. That's a big issue for the Russians. That's almost an existential one, given that the Russians have a one-trick pony economy. So I think Russia is uh, staying close to that challenge and working it diligently. And here I have to give my uh, give a nod and a shout out to Ambassador Pyatt in Greece, who's worked quite diligently. And it's a very good news story how the Greeks have almost uh, eliminated Russian gas in their economy and have replaced it with U.S. gas coming through uh, LNG terminals uh, in Greece. So the nations in the, the region are very cognizant of the challenge. As you recall, the Greeks and the French just signed a deal for more Greek frigates. Uh, the, military cooperation deal that we have now with the Greeks has been reinforced and we have the best military relationship with the Greece that we've ever had. So there's a lot of good things going on in that region as well, but it is one that we need to continue to develop a strategic perspective upon and that we need to continue to allocate resources to assert our rights and privileges in that domain. Hey, uh, being uh, the moderator, seeing no more questions, I'm gonna ask the last, last question. Uh, Mike, uh, we did discuss uh, Ukraine, pr pr predominantly the economic and the diplomatic, but also it comes to mind, you know, what can we do militarily to help support Ukraine uh, over the, in the next months, uh, uh, given uh, Russia's deployment of troops closer to the border uh, and, and the threats that Putin has been making? Um, there's been a lot that's kind of been posited out in the public press, you know, as you know, you know, increasing javelins, increasing air defense, increasing soft, increasing cyber, increasing logistics support, increasing EW and cyber. You know, what, in your view, is the most reasonable thing we can do consistent with the, the, the Ukrainian Support Act of 2014? And what can we do quickly? 
uh, uh, to, uh, to help improve their overall military situation? Oh, it's a great question. And uh, here I would remind everybody that I'm not an employee of the United States government, that these are all my own opinions and don't necessarily reflect any opinion of any branch of the United States government. Uh, and therefore I have to uh, lead with that and you'll understand why. I understand. When we look at the correlation of forces, which you know, based on Soviet military thinking, which is now Russian military thinking in many ways, although it's evolved significantly since then. The number of troops required for the various scenarios that are projected seem to be not yet available to Russia. Because the Ukrainians can muster by their own admission, probably 500,000 troops to put in the field who are defending their homeland. And we learned the hard way in Vietnam and Afghanistan that people defending their homeland are very difficult to defeat because they have nothing to lose. And in this regard, as we think about what the goal of President Putin would be in committing military force to invade the sovereign territory of Ukraine beyond what he's already done, and in what would stiffen the resolve of the Ukrainians to resist in that perspective. I always think about the reaction of Russian mothers to coffins coming back to Russia, whether it was in the catastrophe of the Russian actions in Chechnya early on, the intervention in Afghanistan, even what they're doing with coffins coming back from the Donbass in Ukraine now, and even from Syria. They've been trying to hide it from the Russian people. And mothers and babushkas in Russia are very influential. So this means, to answer your question, the types of, of individual service weapons that can have a significant impact on advancing forces would have the greatest impact and are the easiest to transfer and would benefit from the amount of training we've been giving the Ukrainian army over the last several years. So in this case, javelins, crew service weapons, counter artillery, counter battery, uh, artillery, mortars, types of things that can inflict heavy casualties on motorized infantry and armor, uh, which includes a light air defense stingers, the other sort of uh, weaponry. Again, the small squads and individuals can wield from hidden locations in order to impose costs on advancing troops, because it won't be long before the amount of casualties that the Russians are suffering in Ukraine would cause a significant shift in the population in Russia, which has already been shifting against President Putin in the last couple of years for, for multiple reasons. But I think in this context, it's a very difficult calculation for the Russian leadership as to how many casualties in Ukraine they would actually suffer particularly since their justification is that Ukraine was already always part of Russia and needs to be reincorporated into Russia. And therefore, we're going to do it forcefully by killing people that we consider to be Russians. I mean, the logic just doesn't work. So the, the more we can assert that logic of you're killing Russians to reassert that Ukraine has always been part of Russia, and you're using Russians to do it, and you're killing a lot of people from the Russian Federation in the process, that logic just doesn't hold up. All the other calculations I believe President Putin and his cronies have already made with respect to how much economic sanction they could sustain, how long they could go without selling oil to the Europeans, how much they could uh, do to go around being cut off from the global financial network, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think the, the one thing I don't think they can sustain is a large number of casualties in Ukraine. So any weapons we could provide consistent with the caveats you laid out that would enable individuals and small squads from hidden locations to impose as many casualties as possible on the Russians would quickly grind the invasion to the halt. Mike Ryan's view for what it's worth. Well, Mike, I wanna thank you for joining us this evening and for all of you who turned in uh, here on Zoom and on Facebook uh, to hear uh, this, uh, this session. Uh, here this evening. Uh, if you're interested 
in attending other upcoming uh, IWP webinar events or applying to one of our graduate programs or supporting IWP, please go to iwp.edu. That's iwp.edu. Once again, thanks to Mike Ryan and have a good evening.